Good morning. Um, I, I realize that I do not look anything like the picture in the program. Um, as you know, being in security ages you. I've, uh, I, I've been at this for about uh, eight months. Yeah, eight, eight months, and, and look at me now. Um, no, actually, I, I uh, am very, very happy to be here in London again. Uh, I lived here 20 years ago. I was brought in to work on the security aspects of the merger between Swiss Bank Corporation and SG Warburgs, if there are any of you who remember that. And um, you never really take full advantage in hindsight of being in a place like London until you've left. So uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be back here again. Uh, having everyone ask me, you're not from here, are you? And uh, having, having all the, the wonderful food. And the people are very uniformly nice, especially in the security community here. Everybody's really some of the nicest people that I've ever met. And uh, don't, don't tell the people in this. Wait, this is being recorded by Tripwire, isn't it? Oh, crap. OK. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, how Google turned me into my mother. I'm going to talk about a problem. How many of you are, are caring for older parents or relatives uh, in the audience? Or is everybody too young for that? OK. You'll have to take my word for it then. Um, people who have children, uh, minor children, that they're having to do things online for and everything. There's a large problem that I, I don't think is being adequately addressed yet. And um, it has to do with proxying and delegation. And a lot of you who have worked in identity and access management know that this is, this is a pretty common issue. But the thing is, it's different for the enterprise. Um, and I think this is going to have larger societal implications as we go along. Um, so sort of a definition of proxying, uh, you know, as, as you know, generally a proxy will say, you know, treat me as if I were the thing that you were talking to and I will do all the conversation on their behalf and I will pass it back to them and so on. Uh, it has legal implications, which we'll talk about. Um, any of you who have had to do a, a health care proxy for somebody else, um, I don't know what the legal um, ramifications are here in the UK, but in the United States, uh, again, under certain circumstances, if someone's in the hospital and can't speak for themselves, you would um, help make the decisions for them. And uh, those are some, well, obviously, they have uh, life-changing ramifications for those sorts of decisions that you make for them. And uh, uh, durable power of attorney, again, uh, forgive me, I, I don't know what the, the legal terms here are in the UK. Um, but generally, you can administer the assets of a person on their behalf, whether it's uh, real estate transactions or managing their bank accounts, uh, signing legal documents on their behalf, and so on. Now, in the United States in general, there are two ways that this document can take effect, either immediately, as soon as the person signs it, or upon incapacitation. Now, the legal definition of incapacitation is very difficult to establish. Um, and incapacitation isn't always just being unconscious in, in a hospital or whatever, uh, especially as they're aging. Um, seniors, in particular, tend to have waxing and waning cognitive abilities. Some days they will be very on top of things. Other days, especially if they get a fever or any sort of thing, they enter a state that uh, the medical profession calls delirium, where it's, you know, they may have trouble communicating, having trouble putting a sentence together. They're not sure where they are. They're disoriented. It's not dementia, which is a much more long-term gradual thing, um, but it can look just like dementia. And so, um, in fact, one of the uh, classic signs that uh, EMTs look for if they're called to a house and there's a senior citizen, especially a woman who is, you know, not communicative, is, is very out of it, they suspect a urinary tract infection because those are very asymptomatic for older people, but it immediately results in them just being completely out of it. Uh, my mother, for example, uh, when she had one, drove home, pulled her car into the garage, and immediately fell asleep at the wheel. So that sort of thing. Um, so that there are some uh, very difficult problems with getting someone declared incapacitated for this reason. If you try to go to 
an elderly relative and say, I want to take over everything for you because you can't do it anymore, uh, you're going to have words with that person. It's a very long, difficult psychological struggle for them to start losing the agency in their life and the ability to do things. And many of them will not will not accept it or acknowledge it, you know, all, all the way to the end. So it, it's a very difficult conversation to have. And um, sort of talking between proxy and delegation, it's the, you know, the difference between root and sudo, but the problem is that in real life, none of this is logged. Uh, when you take this over on behalf of somebody else, it's on you to be financially responsible, to be very clear, document everything that you're doing on their behalf, you know, withdrawals you're making from their bank account, bills that you're paying, especially if you're reimbursing yourself, you have to have a very clear documentation trail as to why you're doing it. Um, there, is, uh, there are a lot of problems, especially with seniors being taken advantage of by their relatives. Um, my uh, my half-sister's, uh, half-sister-in-law's father had all of his assets taken by one of her half-siblings um, when he became, uh, to some extent, incapacitated, and uh, the bank accounts were emptied, and you know, the, those funds will never be recovered. So you have to care a lot about that, too, when people are at that very vulnerable stage of their lives. This is a depressing talk, isn't it? I'm sorry. <laughs> So I've talked about this before in the past, that role-based access control um, that doesn't deal with this or with anything else well, really. No, uh, RBAC has its time and place, but generally they're dealing with bundles of entitlements. And if you are delegating access to somebody else, uh, it's usually for a very specific reason. It might be time limited. You don't want them to have all the same bundle of entitlements that come with your role. But if it's too confusing to sort out, if your system is not granular enough to give just those um, accesses that you want them to have, you end up just giving them the whole bundle, um, you know, because you can't be bothered. Um, and again, you know, I'm, I'm out for the next week. Um, Dan Raywood is going to take my place, but I don't want him getting into the silver. Uh, you know, I want him to be able to do some other things on my behalf. And RBAC doesn't, doesn't deal with that too well. So the, the old, sort of old style RBAC is that you have a group of entitlements and they map to your position in the organization. So if you are a research director, here is the role that you are given and it ha comes with a static bundle of entitlements and you know, this is what you should be doing. Um, you add more roles and administrators get all the roles because it's easier that way uh, and, and that's it. That's the way it works. Now, first of all, even in an enterprise, this assumes that you're either a customer or you're an employee. And um, as you know, there are many, many different roles in there. For example, QA testers. QA testers have to have all the roles when they're you know, testing something in an application. An administrator of an application should not be an administrator of the operating system, just of the application. Um, it doesn't reflect uh, different axes of governance. Uh, you are doing this on behalf of this department, you're doing this on behalf of an external customer or uh, another agency. This is particularly difficult and complicated in the public sector for government because your citizens are not your customers. <laughs> they usually don't want to do business with you. They have to. And um, they may be using roles themselves in dealing with you. Uh, for example, it's, it's time for the monthly reporting. Um, you know, I don't really feel like logging in and doing this. Can you do this? Here's the password. Which is another reason why two-factor authentication doesn't necessarily work that well, because they'll just hand over the token and say, can you log in and do the reporting to the state? Thank you. Uh, and it doesn't support context switching. And uh, I'll, I'll show you what I mean. First of all, if you're working for more than one organization or department, uh, when I worked for the state of Texas for the education agency, uh, we had many teachers, for example, who worked for, they moonlighted for more than one school district. Um, there might be legal requirements for separation of duties, so you cannot give out a union set of entitlements. You may be working on behalf of one insurance broker, and then you have to log back out and log back in on behalf of the other insurance broker to do that work. Um, so these sorts of things are just not, in general, not handled very well. 
I had to um, replace a 10-year-old custom single sign-on system that fronted for about 60 applications uh, that were used by a, a statewide external base of about 50,000 users in higher education, school districts, campuses, nonprofits, you know, any agency that had to do something with education. Uh, and uh, so I had to try to migrate that to Tivoli. And I can tell you, I made the IBM engineers cry because the, the, there was just so much complexity in the business rules that had to be built in, and it was a multi-year long project. So let's talk about context plus government, uh, plus governance. There is um, usually an identity authority who says, yes, you know, I've looked at your, your picture ID and I can vouch for you that you are who you say you are. But you also need an access authority, somebody who is responsible for the data that you're going to access and has to give their permission for you to access it, uh, which is not the identity authority. This is where you end up with long forms with multiple signatures on it because everyone has a particular area of governance that they are responsible for administering and they have to sign off on your access. Your, your access. So they have to say both who you are and why you need access to this. So again, at the state you might have a superintendent who says, yes, this staff member at the district works for me. They are in a role of uh, reporting on um, on you know, the free lunch program for poor students. Um, and you know, therefore, they should have access to this system only. And then all that ends up in a bundle of what your entitlements would be. So again, somebody validates you as an individual. Somebody says, here is you know, who, who you are in the context of Whatever it is you're doing, I, I, I don't know what this gentleman here is. He's, he's kind of dodgy, but he's he's waving an ID card, so he must be all right. Um, or, or you know, you're a medical professional. You know, in the Internet of Cows, somebody will validate that you are a cow. So it's it's not just about who you are; it's about what you can do. So you will have a function to do. You will have a scope within which you will do it on behalf of an organization or only until midnight or only on these days or only with these systems and all that will turn into your, your authorization. So it's very much like a game of Clue. Uh, you know, it will be Professor Plum in the kitchen with a lead pipe or maybe with a candlestick or in the library. And this, this is more what you know, enterprise roles and entitlements look like. And in fact, um, it can get even more, um, you can get more complicated because you're really adding different sort of functions. You're either killing or you're being killed in the kitchen with a lead pipe or, you know, whatever. So that it's that combination, especially in a dynamic environment that is going to make identity and access management very complex. So here we go, you know, things, all the combinations that are possible out here, you know, this is, um, this is what people have to deal with in real life. I don't have to tell you this. With an O-Day. In the library. In the shared library. Um, so um, again, this is, this is really how it should be working, and it should be working this way in the, cons I want to say consumer world, but it's like in the real world, the non-enterprise world. Somebody vouches for you. Uh, and if you own the data, you approve the access to it by this organization and by those authorized individuals. And by the way, this is another reason why full federation doesn't always take on, because a lot of organizations don't, won't just accept somebody else's word that they have an employee who needs access to the data for, for legal reasons. They still have to have the final step of approval. And again, th this can lead to a lot of... Um, creative solutions, especially in applications. Um, I once found out that because my organization required so many signatures for legal reasons on forms for every access that somebody had externally, and these things had to be processed on paper, and it was very slow, I found that developers were just creating these nice little backdoor URLs that they were handing out to users to say, just, just click on here and you'll go straight into the application. 
and see what you want to see. And so um, that, that happens a lot. You are a bunch of these things, a bunch of these roles, a parent, an administrator, a customer, a subscriber, and you could be all of these things at different times, and the functions and the scope are different. Um, one, another really big problem that we have in the enterprise today is it used to be in the past that enterprises had used a, a completely different set of software from what you would use personally. I mean, nobody uses an ERP system for fun, right? If, if you do, raise your hand, and, and we'll, we'll stage an intervention. <laughs> but um, nowadays, you may be using uh, Google Docs, you may be using Dropbox. Um, there are so many different types of software that you can be using at any given time, either on your own behalf or behalf of the organization, from the same device, during the day. And the implication of this for the enterprise is that they cannot tell what data is business data anymore. They can't tell by which application created it, which device it was created on, where it's being stored, in which format, where the user was when it was created, what time of day. None of that matters anymore. What matters is the actual content of the data. And you have to look at it very closely to say, does this belong to us? Is this part of the e-discovery? Um, you know, do, do we have to go look at everything that this user has ever touched because they may have something that's responsive to this request? That this is why things have gotten, you know, to the state that they are in now. So let's talk about consumers or uh, normal people, as uh, we may call them. Um, one example is minor children. Uh, I don't know what sort of arrangements you have here, again, in the UK, but um, for my, my prescription insurance provider informed me that as soon as my oldest child turned 13, he would need to have his own login into the online system, and he would need to give me permission to manage his prescriptions for him. And um, I, I'm not sure why it was 13. I don't know if there, there was some sort of... Um, anyway. Something very strange. Then there are incapacitated adults. Now, you may be hit by a bus, or it may be a periodic illness. Um, you could be on really good pain pills. I know that that has happened to me. I've actually written reports under the influence. Uh, if you read some of them, you may be able to tell which ones those were. Uh, but assuming this role takes a lot of time in bureaucracy. I know someone gave a talk at, uh, I think it was B-Sides Atlanta, about how somebody, um, a spouse suddenly passed away and they just could not get access to their accounts, even though it was an emergency. So think about this for a minute. If you walked out of here and you were hit by a bus, who would pay your bills for you and how would they do it? How would they have access to it? Uh, so going up to the official route, you have to be able to prove that this person is incapacitated. Just saying that they're in hospital, well, how long will they be in hospital? Oh, I don't know. Two weeks? Four weeks? Well, you don't need to take it over. Well, yes, there are bills that are due tomorrow. Um, but it's a lot of bureaucracy. And then, as I mentioned, convincing somebody else that they're incapacitated, especially as they get older, it can destroy your relationship. Uh, it, it, it's, it's just horrible. Nobody wants to do this. So, as I mentioned, they said, you know, your 13-year-old has to have his own account and you, he has to give you permission to administer his prescriptions for him. And I said, okay. So I created a second account for my 13-year-old with one of my other email addresses because I knew they would check to see if they were unique. So I used a second email address, gave myself permission, went back to work. Obviously, this was not in the spirit, you know, that they had set this up in, but they really, really did not have a, a, you know, a good answer. And uh, the, the only authentication that was done is demographic data, and, you know, I'm the mother, of course I know when he was born, and, you know, all, all these other things. I forget what they were asking for. But just that, sort, that level of knowledge, I could do everything online and nobody was the wiser. Um, Another example was when I had to take over one of my parents' accounts and I could set up the debt or another medical online thing and I could set it up online and nobody was the wiser. I set it up as my mother and they said, if you want to revoke this, you have to do it in writing. 
I'm like, what? Who, who thought of that business rule? Who, who actually walked through this and figured out that this, you know, made any sort of sense? So the authentication mechanisms for online registration and delegation and so on, they, uh, first of all, you, you need to know what your, the name of your father's first pet was, which you may want to go home and ask if you don't know. Um, you have to be able to navigate online, which again is not necessarily a given. There are still many non-technical people out there. Um, or even if they could at some point, you know, maybe they can't navigate anymore now. So they can't set up the delegation for you anymore. If they could, they wouldn't need it. This is something that you know, people are not talking about. Uh, it, it, they assume that you have standard IDs. As people age in the United States, especially if they can't drive anymore, they won't have a driver's license. It's too difficult for them to get someplace to renew that driver's license. Sometimes they give you a, a, a state ID card instead so that you can go vote. But again, going through that, if you're mentally not you know, really competent enough, it seems like an insurmountable challenge to find out what you need to do, what you need to sign, who you need to go see. Uh, it, they always assume that if you have a different email address, you're a different person, which is, is pretty silly. Uh, they assume that a phone number, especially for two-factor authentication, belongs only to one person, which again, if you have children who want to borrow your devices all the time, you know that's not the case. And uh, there's no cleverness in the security challenge questions. Um, they, they assume that you are not trying to be tricky, um, like, you know, um, British Airways is ridiculous as the answer to, you know, what's your pet's name. They're assuming that when you are, are uh, setting up those challenge questions, you're not trying to be very, very clever. The problem is if somebody else is trying to be clever and you have to figure out the way in which they were clever because you're trying to reconstruct their account later, um, <laughs> you're going to be in trouble. So uh, this is another thing that really bugs me about security challenge questions. There are many, many systems out there where they make you change your password regularly because of regulations, but they don't make you change the answers to your security questions. So as a result, uh, there are some systems where I don't bother remembering my password. I just reset it because I will always answer the same security challenge questions. And if I only have to do this you know, once a quarter, that's what I'm going to do. Um, so you will always fall back to the one factor that you can rely on that is static, um, that you can easily remember. Th this is another gap that we are not dealing with too well. So this is my dad. This was his first um, email address. You can see this is an old UCP format. He was the one who was responsible for getting me into this whole computery thing. Um, at the age of 12, I made a mistake of telling him that I was bored. Never do that. Never tell your parents that you're bored. He threw a basic manual at me and said, go make the bell ring on the teletype over there. Anybody know what a teletype is? It's like, you know, yes. OK, I'm not alone. Um, so he did that. He wrote one of the first Fortran compilers. So he started very, very early in this business. You know, so you, nobody can say he wasn't technical. He was a nuclear physicist without a license. He was an astronomer. Um, he did a lot of hacking on his own. Um, and uh, in fact, he wrote a story about the elegance of programming back in the days when you had to fit it into very, very tiny spaces. Um, and so you may want to read the, the story of Mel. It's also in the back of the Hacker's Dictionary out there. So he, he was the one who really got me started on this. But the problem is, as time went on, he was a total command line guy. He hated Windows with a purple passion. He would not use it at all. He only agreed to use Linux because he could go back to the command line. Um, so there got, got to be a point, especially as online things got more complicated, that he just did not want to deal with them anymore. He was you know, kind of mentally stuck in the 80s, maybe the early 90s. Um, so even for somebody like him who had been in on the ground floor, things have moved to the point where he could not you know, really keep up anymore. So it's a really good thing he didn't believe in security. Because when he had his stroke, I had to, um, he was the one who was paying the bills. I had to break into his banking accounts. And um, yeah, by that time, he was too out of it to be able to, to help me. Luckily, he had cached his Gmail password. 
And if you know that you know that if you want to break into any account, all you have to do is get into their email, and then you can reset everything from there. So that's what I did. You know, and, and there's another thing we you know we have a lot of stock photos, really horrible ones of evil hackers that are male. Why don't why don't we have any good ones that are female? You know, I. This is the only one I could come up with, you know, that and Mrs. Roberts. I guess probably I'm closer to Mrs. Roberts now. So I had to break into all of his accounts. And if I had tried to do this, can you imagine me going to Google and saying, well, you know, my father has had a stroke. Yes, he can speak. No, he really can't tell me how to log in anymore. He can't. Uh, he certainly can't go to his bank and explain everything to them. He can't walk. Um, and in fact, a lot, he sleeps a lot of the day. And you know, trying to go to the bank and saying, I really need to take over his accounts for him. It was easier just to do this all online and just not tell anybody. Now, this is a problem if you have to take over somebody's accounts uh, and work on their behalf. So do you... For example, go to the bank and uh, do you log in to their bank account or do you try to convince them to set up a delegation account with your own login and just delegate all the functions to them? Um, do you change their passwords to something you can remember so that as a result they don't know what it is and they can't get in? Or do you try to remember their passwords? Yeah, I know there, there are things like LastPass and 1Password and that sort of thing, but when it's an emergency and you're trying to figure out what you should do, these are questions you ask yourself. Do you reset the challenge questions? Is it, what was the name of his first pet or what was the name of my first pet? Wait a minute, which one did I set? And again, you know, you're in a crisis, you're very distressed because your parent is very ill, you're trying to make these decisions. Um, do you use your phone and email for two-factor auth? If they didn't have it set up, it's pretty easy, but if they had been using it, do you want to make them feel better and feel like they're still in control by letting them keep you know, the email and phone and so on? If they ask for a phone number, you have to try to figure out what that institution's going to use it for. If they're going to call my mother and say, you've got a problem with your bank balance, you may want to leave it with them. If it is for password resets and you live five miles away or a thousand miles away and you're trying to do this for them, then maybe it should be your phone number. Sometimes they won't let you set two. So there, there are these sort of logistical things that have to get sorted. Now, uh, the arguments for using, their, uh, for using their accounts and just logging in as them is that a lot of institutions still aren't ready to deal with this. Um, and doing it in, the form, in a formal way requires their cooperation. It requires that they are emotionally ready to say, yeah, okay, you know, I'll give you the passwords, I'll let you do this. Even assuming they can remember where they have accounts because a lot of people don't. Um, again, it requires mental capacity, mobility. It requires a lot of paperwork for every account. Most of this has to be done out of band. Uh, notaries public. Um, and, and it requires a lot of time. Now, the, an, another advantage for doing it is that you have an ostensible separation of duties um, in, in some cases. Now, against using their accounts, if they catch you, they may block you. I was administering my mother's accounts, and I actually had a login of my own, but there was one bank account that for some reason the bank would not let me see in my own account. So I just used my mother's account. And um, depending on where I was at any point in the day, uh, some caregiver needed a check, and I didn't have my mother's set of checks because I didn't want to take them from her house because then she would get upset and want to know where they were. So I would write a check, and then I would transfer the money from her account to mine. And I guess the, the first or second time I did that from my mother's account, um, they said, oh, fraud, and they blocked it. And I called them and they said, well, your mother has to go into a bank branch and show ID and explain to them that no, it really was okay. And again, my mother's very, very limited mobility. This would be taking you know, the better part of a day to get her into a bank branch. She would be exhausted afterwards that you know, this is not gonna work. So I just went, okay, and I logged into my account and finished the transactions. So again, this is not a great solution. Um, 
And again, especially if, if they're sort of wavering, if your parents are wavering, there's been maybe some days where they're perfectly fine with you helping out and other days when they're not. And all of a sudden they will say, what are you doing? You're messing around you know, with my things. And they're right, they're absolutely right. Uh, so now we're getting to, to the good part of the story. This is how Google turned me into my mother. So I have four Gmail accounts on my laptop. I have a work one, I have my personal Gmail, and now I have my father's and my mother's. So what happened was when I was going through and setting these up and turning on two-factor off, because again, my father did not believe in security, uh, and, and doing all this, I, I happened to put in my personal address and added it to my mother's Gmail account as an alternate email address. And then I forgot about it because I was doing a lot of, of different things. What happened was I started getting email addressed to me, wendy at nather.com, except they had my mother's real name attached to it. And that was really creepy. Um, I joined the board of a nonprofit organization. They added me to their mailing list, and suddenly it was coming to me under my mother's name, but to my personal address. And I thought, what, what is this? What's going on here? Um, and it was anybody who used Gmail at all. And I, I found out what actually happens is that Gmail will very happily add, very helpfully add, the primary account holder's name to whatever alternate address you're emailing. Now, why is this a problem? Let's say you're Superman and you're setting up gmail.com and you're setting up an alt email. Anybody now who uses Gmail who emails Clark at Kent.com, even as they're composing it, Gmail will say, oh, you mean Superman. So this is, yeah, this is kind of a problem. So I reported this to Google, and they said, no, this is functioning as intended. So I was like, okay, all right. You don't mind if I talk about this then? Oh, no, that's fine. Okay, that's good. Um, so how do we deal with this? The problem is that, especially if you add a delegation account to anything that's very important, finances or, or school logins or everything, if you imagine everything that you are doing in your digital life and having to delegate somebody else to help out with this, first of all, adding another set of credentials doubles the attack surface right there. It's bad enough that your, you know, your mother's account could get hacked, especially if she doesn't choose a great password, or he doesn't believe in security, as my dad didn't. Um, how do you monitor for fraud properly? How do you tell the difference between me reimbursing myself into my bank account because I was writing checks for my mother, as opposed to I'm draining her account dry? And again, a lot of banks have not sorted this out yet they are still thinking about only about ex external attackers and they're looking for those patterns of fraud. They're not looking at, oh, you know, Wendy Nather has the same last name, has a delegation account. If we set up the delegation account, maybe this is okay, you know, for what she's doing. Um, how does revocation work? If they're no longer in a state where they are able to manage their own affairs, how can they revoke this? Um, we don't have a good mechanism for that. If it's out of band, it's too onerous for somebody who's disabled, especially if they're cognitively impaired. Uh, so they really don't have any protections themselves if they want to do that. Um, so that's, these are you know, societal problems, and this is going to get worse as the baby boomer generation ages because um, right now everybody assumes that, oh, these older people, they don't have accounts anyway, they don't know what they're doing but everybody in the boomer generation you know, is living, living the digital high life. You are all living the digital high life. Uh, we need to talk about this. So I hate presenting problems without recommendations. Um, so I'm just going to throw a few out here, but I think it would be worth having a great discussion if you guys run out of things to talk about out there over the Club Mate. Um, first of all, wherever possible in your life right now, go get those pieces of paper. Um, when I had the discussion with my attorney, I went out you know, after this and I, got, um, I gave a durable power of attorney to my husband and I said I wanted it with immediate affect. And 
my attorney said, are you sure you want to do that? And I said, well, if I'm going to trust him then, when I'm incapacitated, I'm going to trust him now. So I recommend you do that because it was, it's much easier once I got this for my father to say, do you want me to just take care of this one thing for you today? And he'd say, yes, and I would go do that. It wasn't a binary thing. It wasn't a, you can't do this anymore. I'm going to do this for you, you know, because that's what they will resist. Do you want me to just help you out? Sure. That's great. That's the conversation you can be having. And then just, you know, put it this way. If you needed me to pay the bills for you, how would I go about doing that? Should we just set this up now just in case? This is a much better conversation than saying, here's a legal document saying you're incapacitated. You really don't want to do that. So do this in your own life. But what we really need are standardization in online systems around these sorts of roles, these dynamic roles, temporary roles, uh, personal proxies and delegates, both for minors and for people in their majority who are temporarily incapacitated, who are periodically incapacitated, um, or who are suddenly and irrevocably incapacitated. We need better integration of digital and legal and physical world authentication. We need ones that take better, um, that, that acknowledge better the, the very complex issues around people who are disabled, uh, people who are economically disadvantaged and have no transport, especially in the United States, that have no transport to, to go to these offices or can't afford to take time off work to get these sort of legal documents executed. They, they also cost money uh, in a lot of cases. And we really need identity authorities that operate in the rest of the normal world that can help vouch for these sorts of roles. The same sort of thing that you would have inside of an enterprise, except it has to be um, something that says, yeah, I know, I know Bob, I know where he lives, I know that he has these roles in the community, um, and I know that this is his son, his son you know, has the authority to do these things on behalf of his father, um, the son also has two minor children and has the right to do these things online on their account, uh, but it needs to be better coordinated. Uh, and then, we, in general, we need better adaptation for all sorts of disabilities, not just um, visual impairment, for example, but cognitive disabilities. And um, we really need to find a way to solve this in the digital world, because otherwise you're disenfranchising people for no reason other than, you know, they have a high fever or, um, you know, they've been used to running their lives, but now suddenly they can't. And then ultimately, if I had all the free time in the world, I would be setting up some sort of service that would help mediate these things, help choose the right um, digital and online solutions for people at different stages of life, different stages of technical knowledge, ability, awareness, um, you know, circumstances, relationships, and so on, because somebody needs to help um, you know, sort this out. At um, assisted living centers now, sometimes they will have um, a consultant who comes in and shows these older folks how to use a computer, which is very nice, but again, it doesn't deal with uh, a lot of the, the complicated logistical things in their life, especially financial and legal transactions. Um, whenever I would have to check my parents into a rehab center, for example, if they had a fall, there would be a stack of papers this high um, to admit them, and I would end up signing them all because, again, whichever parent it was was in no shape to sit there in a chair and sign. So I would you know, sign these things over and over and over and over again, and it was the same if they had a fall every month you know, or, or every three months, it, it would be going through that again. At the hospital, in the emergency room, for the insurance, you know, all these sorts of things. Being able to streamline this and put this uh, you know, in a way online that can be much more easily executed over and over and over and over again is something that we desperately need. Um, if I had all the time in the world, I would set that up. Maybe somebody else um, would be inspired to do that. But I can tell you that having this sort of digital concierge would be a really great thing. So that's my speech. And uh, I, I'd like to know if anybody has any comments that they'd like to share with me.